This pulpit has brought decades and now more than a century of the prophetic witness. And so I bring to you this morning the invocation from a prophet, the prophet of the biblical Micah. And his words turned to this week. They shall bear their swords into plowshares and their guns into pruning hooks. People and nations shall not lift up their guns against themselves or their enemy. Neither shall they learn war anymore, but they shall all sit under their own vines and fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. If you bring this day fear with you to this place, know that it is welcome. And know that here, the message and power of life and life abundant is ready and willing to comfort as you would have need and to challenge as your life would allow. May it be so as we enter this day, the day the Lord has made indeed. Let us now rise as we're able and sing hymn number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath. Would you join me in the responsive invocation printed in your bulletin? For women, poetry is not a luxury. It is a necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of life. It is a need to our hopes and dreams for survival and change. First made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. I can think of little more helpful words of invocation this week as we gather our hearts and minds to the people of Florida and to a nation as a whole and want to ask that we take this time which we normally reserve for welcome 
a chance in which I would normally introduce Catherine Baker, our guest preacher this morning. I'm going to let Catherine introduce herself. And I want to ask us if we would take just a moment, a moment that normally we welcome in those who may be new amongst us to tell the story and welcome of who we are as a people, to quiet ourselves. And they name that as it talks about naming poetry, the value of presence, to be fully here, particularly at a time when those far from us, and maybe not so far, struggle with the insanity of a world which would take the life of children and then make excuses. Let us take one minute so that we might choose to be present as those who would claim a space of safety and healing, no matter your need, this day. May it be so that we are the witnesses to a new possibility upon the earth. I'm not a minister who is at all interested in the shame game, so hear my words of encouragement. We missed an opportunity there. The overtones in the end of that piece were as extraordinary a moment to pay attention to the fact that it's the Asian New Year and a new moon, and it is the beginning of Lent, and it is a pause before beginning the most courageous thing you will ever do, which is to decide to have another year. 
So when we hear things that clearly offer that kind of still, reverent moment, I want to encourage us to not let our excitement at the opportunity miss the chance to simply sit in the afterglow. They don't come out too often. Again, hear my, hear my words as encouragement, not shame. I'm going to give you another chance for silence when we get to prayer and meditation. And I might just ask Ed to play the last couple bars of that again when we get there. So I want to ask Ed if you might consider giving us the last few bars of your piece there in just a moment as we head into our prayer meditation in silence. This community is offering uh, a study during Lent, uh, pairing a book written by a pioneer in the world of Buddhist hospice, those who focus on full presence of life during the part of life called dying. Um, if you're interested in that, you will find it on the website and other places. It's every Wednesday night for the next five Wednesdays. And our own uh, Meredith Bradley, who sings in the choir, will be facilitating this. Meredith actually is a student of the author. So we are really in for a treat there. And this morning, as a part of our chapel gathering, we focused on two of the five precepts, or what Mr. Ostaseski calls invitations. And they are five precepts which he believes the art of dying well teach us about the art of living well. And really this is an extraordinary opportunity to focus both Lent with its traditional story of moving towards Jerusalem, the city of peace, a place that was initially inhabited before biblical times by a people called the Jebusites who worshipped the setting sun. The setting sun. The sun that dies. The sun that helps us to remember that even our breath is impermanent. And so I welcome you as you breathe and meditate or pray as is your practice to bring to your heart and mind that extraordinary rhythm as we begin a new year in the lunar calendar. And hear these, these notes of music which beg a kind of expectation that maybe our journey this year is not so much about an outcome we are trying to grasp, 
but a way of embracing the wisdom of impertinence that would allow us to simply be fully present in what is to come. Can we practice that kind of courage of our full presence in the life that is about to be offered? Ed, would you give us a few notes and then we'll hold ourselves in stillness. May it be so, and amen. Before our choir sings, we're going to allow Catherine to come forward and offer the reading, and we'll follow that with the choir's offering. Good morning. This morning, the selection that comes to us via the lectionary is from the Christian scriptures, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. Listen for the movement of the story and the brief vignettes of Christ's baptism, temptation, and transition to ministry. And please pray with me. Guide us, O God by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see life, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Amen. From Mark 1, 9 through 20. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John into the river Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw the heavens torn apart, and Jesus saw the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness, He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and Jesus was with the wild beasts and with the angels who attended him. But after after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee to proclaim the good news of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. And as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon and his brother Peter, or Simon and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the lake as they were fishing. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed Jesus. And when Jesus had gone a little further, he saw James and John, sons of Zebedee, in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, Jesus called them, and they left their father with a hired staff, and they too followed Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Lions, tigers, and prayers. A celebration of identity, complexity, and freedom. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What a beautiful and radiant wintry morning to be with you here at Fountain Street Church, celebrating the Chinese New Year, African American History Month, and welcoming the season of Lent. The Olympics are going on in Pyeongchang, South Korea. It's Black Panther's opening weekend at the box office. And I was told that you have had lion dancers fill this sanctuary in years past. Let me say that in the overabundance of whiteness and gray in West Michigan, that nothing fills my heart with more brightness and cheer than a little bit of color. For those of you who may not know me or may be wondering what this Asian American clergywoman from the clergy from the Reformed tradition is doing in your pulpit all robed up, let me introduce myself. 
My name is Katherine Lee Baker. I'm an ordained minister in the Reformed Church of America. I am happy to be back in Grand Rapids, Michigan, after spending much of my formative time of ministry on the East Coast in the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I'm currently serving as a chaplain and coordinator of spiritual care at Mercy Health St. Mary's just down the street. And while I have enjoyed a slight shift from parish ministry to clinical work, I have missed preaching. And I have missed shaking things up from the pulpit simply by offering the voice and the perspective of a young person of color, adoptee, divorcee, feminist, womanist, visionary, and failure alike. I am delighted to be with you here this morning at Fountain Street Church as your guest speaker, filling one of the very few pulpits in West Michigan in which I do not have to filter or censor myself for fear of losing my job or sounding like a heretic. Thank God. Thank you. <laughs> this could get interesting. This morning, there is a lot going on in our community, in our nation, and in our world that we celebrate because it informs and contributes to who we are as people striving to free the mind, grow the soul, and change the world. And it is perfectly appropriate to cherish our gold medals, our red envelopes, and our black panthers as symbols of progress and hope. It is a joyful thing to watch opening ceremonies featuring lions and tigers and dragons and flash mobs of beautiful choreography. It is a joyful thing to participate in traditions of feasting and honoring our ancestors. And it is a joyful thing to cheer on our heroes and heroines who spark our imaginations and inspire our inner ambitions. But this morning, we also gather here in the sanctuary, reminded and cognizant that all is not well in the world, even if it is well in this place of worship. There's a lot going on in our community, in our nation, and in our world that we condemn because it disturbs and it grieves us as people seeking equality for all and privileges for none. It is perfectly appropriate at this time to question how we might respond, what we might do, and where we might go. Nations are still in upheaval and tumult. Communities still wrestle with injustice and discrimination. And humankind is still broken, angry, and afraid. This morning, our deepest sympathies lie with Parkland, Florida, whose community suffered one of the 10 deadliest mass shootings in recent U.S. history at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School this past Wednesday, February 14th. The lives of students Alyssa Alhadef, Martin Duque Aguiano, Nicholas Dwaret, Jamie Gutenberg, Luke Hoyer, Kara Lofren, Gina Montalto, Joaquin Oliver, Elena Petty, Meadow Pollock, Helena Ramsey, Alex Shader, Carmen Shentrup, and Peter Wang, as well as the lives of faculty and staff, Scott Beagle, Aaron Feiss, and Christopher Hickson, were all lost. In one sweeping moment of violence and savagery, devastation and grief swept the quaint suburb near Fort Lauderdale in the Miami metropolitan area. Gathering here this morning, we have been reminded over and over that we are called to pause, to witness, and to remember. And we are called to belong to one another and to the world around us, whether we are atheists, Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, humanists, Muslims, or the like, whether we live in Parkland, Pyeongchang, Hollywood, or Grand Rapids. It is when the universe feels the most unfair, uncertain, and overwhelming 
And when we see or recognize what it is to be vulnerable, destitute, or marginalized, that our belonging to one another counts the most. We are called to offer each other the sacred spaces and holy moments to doubt, to believe, and we are called to provide a place and a culture for weary travelers, refugees, and mourners to call home. As I revisited the lectionary passage for this morning with an apprehensive heart, I decided to retitle my sermon, Lion, Tigers, and Prayers. Why? Because it occurred to me that just as you, Fountain Street Church, have been examining the Psalms over the past several weeks and exploring what prayer looks like in your various contexts, it is the theme of prayer that continues to guide us today in the Gospel of Mark as Jesus makes his debut in the first of the New Testament scriptures. I say first because the author of Mark served as the primary source and narrative of the Gospel stories, which makes the account structurally pithy, and it makes it focused on detail only when necessary and focused on purpose and action throughout. Reading the brief selection from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 to 20, it's clear that the author of Mark wastes no time disclosing birth accounts or genealogies, but simply shares brief vignettes that define the basis of whom this character, Jesus Christ, really was. In the lectionary passage for this morning, we encounter Jesus Christ as his identity is revealed to be God's beloved son, as the heavens were torn apart and as the spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then we follow Jesus as the spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, accompanied both by wild beasts and service angels waiting upon him. And finally, we receive Jesus as he returns home, proclaiming the good news of salvation, calling people to repentance, and inviting disciples to leave their kin behind and to follow him. Theologically, the Gospel of Mark signals that the divine life of Jesus Christ is both marvelous and dangerous. There is an implication that those of us who would follow Jesus as his disciples would also be subject to the same. In each vignette, there is that paradox. The waters of baptism has a peaceful dove and a torrential sky. In the wilderness with Satan are wild beasts and attending angels. And along the shore of Galilee, both acceptance and also abandonment. Woven throughout this passage is a message of identity, complexity, and freedom that offers us a sense of transformative courage and radical hope. In a time when we can feel discouraged, frustrated, or sometimes powerless, examining Jesus Christ through the Gospel of Mark helps us to recover our sense of authority, advocacy, and agency in this world. In the lectionary passage this morning, the author of Mark provides a less obvious illustration for what prayers and for what prayers can look like, providing us a model to reclaim the complexity of our prayers and our identities as people who pray in a society that many times forgets or neglects to associate those prayers with purpose and with action. What I'm referring to is this. Many of us internet junkies and media trolls have seen by now the image online with the words thoughts and prayers crossed out to read policy and change. Personally, I am a big fan of this because I think the image is the pedestrian and most accessible way to communicate that if we believe that prayers matter and if we believe that prayer changes things, then we have to reclaim what it means to offer our prayers. This morning, as we gather in this beautiful and cheerful sanctuary, celebrating cross-cultural worship with a room full of avid moviegoers and Olympic fan sections, the Gospel of Mark offers for us 
brief vignettes highlighting Jesus Christ as he listens for God, speaks back to the powers of the world, and calls the community to a collective response of purpose and of action. For Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, prayer isn't just talking at an invisible and listless deity, spending time either venting or praising or blathering with self-talk. But prayer is shown as listening for voices that proclaim words of love and truth, whether they come peacefully or torrentially, and whether or not they come from places or people we might expect. For Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, prayer is not just limited to sitting around in contemplation or going on a nature hike, but prayer is also speaking truth to power and confronting the evils of this world. Prayer is trusting God's provision of spiritual gifts, company, and sustenance in whatever wilderness or wasteland we find ourselves in or driven towards. Prayer is trusting that your voice and your perspective matters because it is your voice and your perspective of compassion, integrity, and justice that the world so desperately needs to hear and to see lived out both verbally and non-verbally. And for Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, Prayer is not simply focusing on ourselves, on our own messages and agendas, but prayer is about identifying and empowering the gifts and the talents of those around us, calling one another to significance and self-worth. In the Gospel of Mark, this is what true prayer can look like. And for you, the congregation of Fountain Street Church, I think that this is what your prayers can look like too. If we are the ones who are praying, then we are the ones who have control over what prayer means and how our prayers will be lived out in our everyday life. These prayers call us to authority, advocacy, and agency in this world. For me, it is a daily struggle to believe that the complexity of my prayers, as well as my identity as a prayer, someone who prays, matters. When you are so used to having people mansplain, white-splain, interrupt, ignore, discount, or silence you, you begin to wonder if God does too. But here's how I know that my identity as someone who prays matters. Because I see my prayers enveloped in Christ's own, and I see my prayers acted out throughout scriptures. I see evidence of my prayers persisting in the world around me. I see prayers of, I see my own prayers represented when Brian Coogler makes amazing movies, which liberates the academy and challenges public culture to recognize that all lives matter when black lives matter. I see my prayers answered when I see divided nations laying aside their differences to gather around events like curling and alpine skiing. And I see my prayers being answered and acknowledged when teachers, students, educational staff, and our communities rally around to stage walkouts in order to call attention to policy and change. I believe that prayer matters. I believe that prayer changes things. And I believe that I am called to pray in a way that celebrates diversity and equality. I believe that I'm called to pray in a way that condemns injustice and discrimination and that seeks to bring radical healing to systemic brokenness in this world 
that we live in. And I believe that I am not alone in this calling. Even in the overabundance of whiteness and gray in West Michigan, prayer, this type of prayer, can bring us in our community, in our nation, and in our world back to life. This is where we can go, what we can do, and how we can respond today, whatever it means to you, how will you reclaim prayer? In the name of God, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit, amen. Please sing with, please let us close with our, our final hymn. Let me check what that is. Hymn number 27, please stand to sing, I am that great and fiery force. My new friends and beloved in faith, go from this place knowing that you are not alone, but that you are called to purpose, to agency, to advocacy in this world, and that you are blessed. And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who sometimes is torrential as peaceful, be and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.